Okay, and welcome back students who are taking financial accounting. And in this uh, series of videos, we are working on the theory for chapter 10, which is on corporations, paid in capital and retained earnings. And in uh, so far, we've covered how corporations are organized, um, uh, common stock and preferred stock, the difference. Um, we talked about dividends and then how to divide the dividends between common and preferred stock and whether they're cumulative or non-cumulative. So in this video, we're going to talk about stock dividends and stock splits. So let me jump down there okay, and get my pen. Okay, so um, when we were talking about dividends, come on, there's the pen, okay. Um, when we were talking about dividends, I had said that um, we take uh, what happens is is you have revenues less your expenses, which gives you a profit or loss. That profit or loss is closed out to retained earnings. Okay, and generally the corporation decides, okay, if I want if they want to pay a dividend, they take the money out of the retained earnings and they pay it out as cash um, to the uh, shareholders um, or the uh, they can convert that cash into more shares of stock. Right? Now, when uh, they take it out of uh, retained earnings, okay, remember the normal balance of retained earnings is a credit. So when they take it out of retained earnings, they're going to debit the retained earnings account. Okay, And let's just say, um, in the, and I'll just use the numbers that were in the book, 20,000. Okay, And they put it to uh, they credit dividends payable right, for the 20000 Why? Because you have, the, um, you have the declaration date. So on the declaration date, they say, okay, we're going to pay out this here $20,000. Okay. Um, and when they do, that is the journal entry that is made because they're declaring it. Now notice that it hasn't been paid yet. That's why it's a payable account. It's a liability, right? Um, then we have the date of record, right? Which says um, on that particular date, um, anybody who has shares will get uh, a portion of that dividend. There's no journal entry for that because that's just the date of record. There's no transaction actually occurs, right? But then on the payment date is when they actually pay that dividend out. So on the payment date, um, they end up crediting the cash right, for the $20,000 that they're going to pay out, and they debit the dividend payable account for the $20,000. So this credit to the dividend payable and the debit you know wash each other out and so in effect you have the debit to retained earnings and a credit to cash just like an accounts payable or just like an accounts receivable okay so um you know instead we're using a dividends payable account and that's the way you uh you handle the normal transaction for uh dividends that's the way you make your normal journal entries but what happens when you have a stock dividend, okay? A stock dividend is, instead of actually paying out the cash, um, what you do, what you, what they decide to do is, is that they decide to pay um, the dividend with additional shares of stock, right? So in this case here, um, they say, okay, they determine what they're going to do as far as the dividends is concerned. And I'm just going to kind of like use the example that's in the book. Okay. Um, there's in the book, they have 500,000 shares. Okay. And they decide that they're going to pay a 5% common stock, uh, a, a common stock dividend. Okay. And so the 5% is important. And they also have to consider what the market rate is, okay? Not the par value. Um, and the example in the book, they're using $40 as the market rate. 
so when they do them when you take 500,000 times the 5% times the market rate that's a um, million dollars okay that's going to come out of retained earnings well all we're doing is um, just rearranging the uh, we're moving money from one account to another we're not actually um, uh, paying it out in cash so from retained earnings we're going to take that a million dollars out of retained earnings and put it into our common stock account and we're going to put it into our excess of par account paid in capital and excess of par okay so um, what that looks like is we end up saying okay we, we need to take the money out of the retained earnings so we're going to debit our retained earnings for the one million dollars okay now when we're crediting our common stock we have to consider um, that it's the par value of our common stock was one dollar okay so we have five hundred thousand shares okay times the five percent that's um, you know the, uh, what they decided upon and paying the stock dividend times the one dollar in par okay so that ends up increasing the common stock by twenty five thousand dollars when you do the math five hundred thousand times five percent times a dollar is twenty five thousand dollars okay so that is what in, that's how much the actual common stock will increase the number of shares of stock will increase but of course the difference between the two is our paid in capital um, in excess of par and that would be for common stock Okay. And the difference between those two is an additional $975,000. Okay. So that's, the, that's how you make the journal entry to record um, that stock dividend. All we're doing is, is we're saying, okay, we're taking the actual retained earnings, which if we uh, normally pay that out, that would be, you know, we'd convert that to cash. If we want to reduce retained earnings, we would debit retained earnings and credit cash. But we're not uh, paying it out in cash. We're paying it out in stock. So all we're doing is just taking it out of retained earnings and figuring out how much, um, you know, based upon that dividend, how much our common stock increases, and then whatever in excess of par, because the par is one dollar, okay, but the market value is forty dollars, right? And that's the easier way to do it, all right, by figuring out how much the common stock is and then backing into you know, doing the math to say uh, debits have to equal credits. So if I have 25,000 in common stock, then my paid in capital has to be 975,000. It's easier to, to, to do it that way than to actually have to sit down and figure out what the in excess of par is because you're talking about $40 less $1 and, you know, you're doing the same math again, but you're doing a lot more steps, okay? So there's a couple of different ways of doing it, but this is uh, the easiest way to do it. So stick with it. Um, you know, again, the uh, op, the other way of doing it is is figuring it out the same exact way as you did with your uh, common stock. You can say, okay, for my common stock, I have 500,000 shares times 5% times $1 par. That gives me my 25,000. Then I can take my paid in capital and say 500,000 shares times 5% times, now I have to take and say my market value is forty dollars less my one dollar of common which is now thirty nine dollars okay my one dollar in par which is now thirty nine dollars in excess and that when i do that math i end up with nine hundred seventy five thousand notice how many more steps i have to go through in doing it this way versus just going and say versus just doing i have to do the math in order to get the 25,000 okay I have to do the math to get that so that's a step I have to actually do but why go through all that additional trouble when all I could do is just take the difference between these two numbers that's what backing into the 975 is about okay all right
So that's the concept and theory behind it. Okay. Now notice I just did this with just common stock in order to be able to keep it relatively simple. Realize that um, we can also have, you know, I mean, I was talking about just common stock here. But this equally applies to preferred stock. Okay. Because we record preferred stock in very, in very similar ways we do our common stock. And then, since this is just a, um, a, since the stock dividend is just that, it's a dividend, we still have the same issues that we come across when we're trying to divide between common versus preferred right stock and in that is in that vein because we're dividing it between common and preferred we still have these the issue of cumulative versus non-cumulative so if you didn't understand this division amongst common and preferred and cumulative versus non-cumulative this is very important Go back to the last video and watch. I mean, it's a 35-minute video. I understand that. Um, but you have to get the underlying concept. You have to understand you know, how we determine what goes to common, what goes to preferred, and you know, what portion of the dividend. Because declaring the dividend is relatively easy. They, you can sit there and say, ah, $500,000, or you can say 5%. And you just do the math, and that's how much the dividend is. But how it gets distributed is very, very different. On the simplest level, if all you had was just common stock, you take the number of shares of the common stock and you divide it into um, whatever amount that dividend is. And you get you know, the dividend per share. Right? So then anybody who has shares, however many shares they get, they get that you know, dollar amount times their shares. That's the simplest level. That's not how a lot of businesses, you know, bigger corporations work. They have, um, more, they generally do have preferred stock, and they do have um, uh, different, as I said, different ways of figuring out what preferred is going to get and how it's going to be distributed. So here, you know, all of this thinking here about uh, the stock dividend. Um, being distributed to common and preferred, and whether it's cumulative or non-cumulative, equally applies. All we're doing is, is instead of talking about paying a cash dividend, we're talking about paying a, uh, a stock dividend. And we're using the same accounts, like in this case here for common, we're using common stock and the paid in capital in excess of par for common stock. And if it was for preferred, it would be preferred stock instead and paid in capital in excess of par but for the preferred stock so i'm not going to you know uh, take this all the idea here is this is what a stock dividend is it's taking it out of retained earnings here and putting uh moving it to common stock in excess of par that's all it is um, for a stock dividend but I open up a can of worms. I can go on forever with different examples of how to distribute it between common and preferred. Okay, uh, and that's not going to happen. <laughs> so um, you you know this is one of these things where you have to understand the underlying concepts of you know what is common, what is preferred, how they're created, how they're paid, and then um, how they're distributed and whether it's cumulative or non-cumulative. Yeah you have to get that concept down and then apply it to each and every uh, situation. Okay, so that's stock dividends. Now, if you didn't understand that, watch the video again. Definitely read the book. And if you're, you know, uh, doing the homework problems will help um, because you get practice in applying that understanding of the concept. Okay. Um, but if you still don't get it, then, you know, call and speak with an instructor and uh, you know they'll try to walk you through but just realize that even though they walk you through one situation it is not going to be you know the same for the next situation you have to develop the thought process in order to be able to think through um, what it is that you're doing okay um, you have to look and see the, the slight changes 
that occur that are part of parameters of that distribution. Right? Now for stock splits, um, what is a stock split? Well, let's just say the price of the stock, um, and let's do it like this. Let's say the price of the stock was one dollar. Okay, and this is what this you know, it's one dollar, and this is what it looks like on a uh, on a uh, technical chart, price chart. And let's say the price changes and it goes up, and right now it's sitting at one hundred dollars up here. Okay, this is a price stock price chart. So it went from hundred uh, from one to one hundred dollars. Now the reason why they have stock splits is because at a hundred dollars. Um, a lot of people, you know, less people can afford to pay the hundred dollars for per share of stock. So, and what the, the company want and decides to do is they decide to say, okay, um, right now we have, and I'm just making this up, a hundred thousand shares, okay, and the price of each one of those shares is a hundred dollars. So what they decide to do is they decide to have a stock split. Now, a stock split generally is a two-for-one type of thing, okay? Meaning, um, when they split it, they split it in half. They could have, you know, they can make this up. I mean, you've you've had, I've seen ten-for-one splits, okay? Four-for-one splits. They can decide upon however they want to to change this. So again, this is not a you know, cookie cutter type of thing. Okay, um, I'll, we generally use the two for one the stock split where they're splitting it in half as an example because that's the most common one. When um, when they do a reverse split, and I'll get into that in just a second. Generally, that reverse split is something uh, they use a one for ten type of thing. Okay, but you'll see that in just a second. So the stock is here at a hundred. And when they decide to have a stock split, what happens is it reduces the price in half. That's why it's called a stock split. So the price gets reduced to 50, gets reduced to half, but that doubles the number of shares, right, of the stock. Right? So the net effect is still the same, but what it um, what it does is it changes the price of the stock. If I had 100,000 shares at $100, okay, that means I have $1 million. I believe that's $1 million. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, 100,000 times 100 is $1 million, okay? After the stock split, now what happens is I have 200 share, 200,000 shares, but they're, they're at $50 a share instead, and that's still the same $1 million, okay? Um, but having the stock split doesn't change the dollar amount on your uh, retained earnings. What it does is it changes the price and the number of shares. All right, and you can look at the uh, figure in the book, the exhibit in the book. But I'll get to that in just a second because I want to also cover this idea of a reverse split. Um, and before I get to that, uh, before I talk about that real quick, um, just realize that. As a, as a different example, instead of, um, let's say they have, decide to have a four for one split, okay? Well, that means the price would end up being reduced down to $25, okay? But the number of shares would be four times as much. So we'd have 400,000 shares. So 400,000 shares times $25 a share, it still gives me the $1 million. So you see that, um, the value doesn't change. All that changes is the dollar value, the dollar per share, and the number of shares. Now, that's a stock split, um, where you have a high price, and they want to uh, lower that price um, in order for more investors to be able to come into the marketplace um, and be able to get uh, more money. But now. We can also do, we can have, a, let's say the stock went like this, okay? And then for whatever reason, it goes down like this, okay? Um, and they're back down here and they're $1, okay? Well, for whatever reason, you know, what they can do is they can have what's called a reverse split. A reverse split meaning if I have 100,000 shares, okay? And let's say I want to reverse split it at 1 for 10, Okay. So what will happen is 
we're going the price will change because it's 10 right the price will change and we'll have the uh, the new price of the stock will now be ten dollars okay right we're, we're increasing the price of the stock to make it more attractive because a lot of people don't like you know uh, penny stocks or really low valued stocks but now instead of having a hundred thousand shares we're going divide, to divide that by ten and we're only going to have ten thousand shares available notice the math again a hundred thousand shares times one dollar a share is a hundred thousand dollars okay but when we reverse it now we only have ten dollar ten thousand shares but each share is still is now worth ten dollars and the same value is a hundred thousand okay so the the value doesn't change what changes is the number of shares and the dollar price and so this is known as a reverse split okay now what is the effect since the value doesn't change in our equity section of the the balance sheet um, what does change well um, if you look at the example uh, the exhibit in the, um, the textbook okay um, what you and I'll just uh, write it out real quick so we have common stock right um, the, the value was one dollar par. Um, they had two hundred two million shares authorized, and they had five hundred twenty-five thousand shares that were issued and outstanding. And outstanding. Okay. So they decide to have a stock split. Okay, um, so this is before before the split, and this is after the split. Okay, so when it's after the split, um, that particular account is going to change. All right. What did we say changes? We said the price changes, the dollar value, and the number of shares. Right. So if the dollar value is a dollar and they split it in half, okay, because let's say the stock split is a is a two for one split, right? If they decide to split it in half, that means the dollar value gets reduced by half. So it's now a uh, 50 cent par stock, okay? Um, and the number of shares gets doubled. So instead of having uh, two million shares, we now have four million shares, all right? that's authorized and instead of having 525,000 issued and outstanding now we have um, 1 million 50,000 shares that are issued and outstanding okay so um, you know nothing else changes okay all that is changed is the um, is the number of shares in the dollar uh, the dollar amount per share and the 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 balance sheet the equity section of the balance sheet just that line item changes okay now yes um, you know since all we're doing you know you think well is there a transaction for this okay um, you, because you're not debiting anything, you're not crediting anything, you're only using its one account. Yes, you do need to record this so that it is there in the books as to why you're making the change to this particular account. right? So what you're going to do is, as uh, part of your journal entry, you're going to record this old information and then you will record the new information okay? in your journal. Of course, in your debits and credits, there's zero. There's no no uh, net effect. All you're uh, changing is the uh, the dollar value and the number of shares. Okay, but you're recording that as a journal entry. You're putting this old information in, putting new information, and then you write your description to record, you know, uh, a stock split. You know, the two for one stock split. Uh, in order to uh, 
uh, have an entry that shows why you're changing uh, the parameters of that particular account. Okay, um, and really that's all there is to the stock splits. I mean, if it was a reverse stock split, you know, you're recording, you're, you're taking your before information. So if this was a reverse stock split, you're taking your before information, and you you know uh, figure it out. Like let's say this was a uh, a one for ten. All right. So your par now would have been um, ten dollars, right? And instead of two million, you'd have two hundred thousand uh, shares of of stock. And instead of five hundred twenty-five, we'd have uh, fifty. Uh, 52,500 okay um, and we would record that after information down here in the the new the before would be the old and whatever changed would be in the new right and so that's how you record a reverse stock split it's not rocket science all it is is just uh, changing the numbers so and with that said that's like covering the idea of you know what a stock dividend is and how to record it and what a stock split is and how to make that change so that it, it's reflected on your balance sheet so with that said we've kind of like now so far um, we've covered you know how a company started you know uh, so it gets how we uh, how a corporation is created which creates stock We've talked about the two most common stock, you know, two most classes of stock, which is common and preferred, and their in, their interrelationship between each other. We've talked about um, having a dividend and how it's distributed between the two, and now we've talked about having a stock dividend, which essentially is the same as a regular cash dividend, except you're getting stock instead of uh, cash, and we've talked about uh, stock splits in either direction. Um, there's one other class of, of stock that's uh, out there, and that's called treasury stock. Um, and that's when a business buys back their stock, and that's what we'll cover in the next video. So if you didn't understand this, reread the textbook, watch the videos again, and if you still don't get it, um, you know, feel free to contact an instructor because even though it is, a, it is relatively easy, um, it is a little bit quirky in that, again, you have to understand the underlying concepts but when it comes to the application aspect of it it gets a little bit hairy because no two situations are uh, identical you know each one is is unique they operate on the same principles the same processes but applying gets to be a little hairy at times depending upon how complicated the the uh, the parameters are All right so with that said um, I'll see you in the next video for Treasury stock